Well, hello, John. Hello, Jason. It seems to be uh, maintenance month uh, <laughs> for the show. Um, A lack of, lack of maintenance month. Well, that too. But being that we're flight safety detectives and uh, we're looking at some of the maintenance issues that are popping up in some of the more recent uh, accidents that we've been following, um, I think it's uh, it's not a bad idea to spend at least two or three shows, even all in one month, to talk about maintenance issues because we are coming into a change of season now um, with uh, the weather turning colder. And of course, people not wanting to get down on the ground or scoot around an airplane doing a pre-flight um, just because of the cold weather and, and other aspects of flying in, uh, in an environment that isn't conducive to spending a lot of time outside. Um, these are the little things. It's the little things that come back to haunt a pilot and or an operator slash pilot um, with regard to accidents and incidents. And today we're gonna talk about two events, one involving a twin engine Viper Seneca and the other involving a uh, Cessna 172, an older model Cessna 172. Both have a message to them. And then on top of that, besides what the NTSB went and, and found as far as the obvious cause, in looking at some of the pictures that were included in these two reports uh, in the public docket by the NTSB. There are other things that stood out to us detectives that uh, are critical to the safe operation of, uh, of these airplanes. And so uh, getting into all of this, um, in the past, gentlemen, we have been talking about uh, an accident that we dissected on a previous show with regard to the condition of the engine and, and some ongoing long-term uh, issues that, uh, that eventually caused a, uh, a problem with the engine. And then of course, the operational aspects of a pilot trying to deal with a loss of power, trying to make a forced landing, unfortunately losing control of the airplane. These two accidents, at least the uh, Piper Seneca was uh, survivable because the airplane had, uh, had lost directional control on landing uh, after having just come out of maintenance. Whereas the 172 we'll talk about was in fact a, a fatality. So let's, uh, let's get right into the Piper Seneca. Well, before we do that, let's let, remind all of our listeners that today's show is being brought to you by Gamma, the Professional Aviation Maintenance Association, as well as Avemco. And, uh, who I believe is the premier general aviation insurer in the country. And if you own an airplane and you need health insurance, or if you're a CFI and you need insurance, or if you need liability insurance, if you need any kind of coverage for your airplane, then give Avemco a call. 888-879-0389 is their number, or avemco.com on the web. Nice people to deal with. Very forgiving, and uh, <laughs> we can talk about the forgiving because they sponsor our show and they have to put up with you, John. That's why they're forgiving. <laughs> yeah, they, and, and they they insured you, so I. Well, that that's why they're forgiving. Yes, absolutely. And the, but uh, in the junk airplanes that you buy. Hey, 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 hey! I Jason, would never do that. Jason and I have already pledged that before you get your hands on this. This uh, your next purchase. We're going to be going over it with a fine tooth comb. Well, good. I hope and so. We're not going to fix it. We're going to take out insurance on you. <laughs> That's right. Greg knows my golden rule. If my kids can't fly in it with him, then he ain't flying it. There you go. See, I like that golden rule because that's the one I live by too. I won't fly myself in it. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you know, when we speak of insurance, these two accidents kind of, uh, you know, would light up an insurance company because they were so preventable um, with a little extra work and uh, a little closer in uh, scrutiny and during the inspection process. The Piper Seneca was a, a training airplane. Um, it was a flight instructor and a student on board. They were out doing multi-engine training and uh, the airplane had been out of maintenance for about 25 hours on landing during the course of the landing rollout, the right landing gear folded up and uh, the airplane went zinging off the right side of the runway. Of course, damage to the airplane, but uh, the flight instructor and uh, student were able to get out of the airplane unscathed. 
They uh, pick the airplane up, they start examining it, and lo and behold, when they look at both the uh, torque links on the left and right landing gear, they find out that the, the right landing gear torque link was totally separated and intact. And um, a clo closer inspection that the bolts and the nuts and the castellated nut um, had separated and there was no cotter key or cotter pin in that right landing gear. They go over, look at the left one and sure enough, it's still intact with the exception that the cotter pin is missing. So as you get more into the discussion that the NTSB put out in their report, and of course, looking at the, the photographs that were included, um, the airplane had been in for maintenance. Uh, they did replace both torque links on the, uh, on the aircraft and they put it every, supposedly everything back together again um, as required to include the, uh, the cotter pin. They were doing a gear swing. They found that they had a problem with the uh, brake lines and some rubbing going on. So they had to loosen up. That means take the cotter pin out of the torque link nut and loosen that nut, readjust the brake lines, tighten it all back up. When they did that, they forgot to put the cotter pins back in. So now the airplane goes out and flies for 25 hours. And of course the right uh, castellated nut comes loose, starts to back off, separates, and the rest is proverbial history. While it sounds real simple, there is a message there. And, you know, you being in the maintenance business, both you and, uh, you know, John and Jason, um, you know, inspections, especially after you think the work has been completed, but you've had to go in and make readjustments or, or tweak something. How critical are these little things and how important is it to go back and reinspect your work? That's very, very critical. Even on an airline level, I've seen many, many times that after, uh, after we did some work and the inspector came out and looked at it, then we got back in and we had to tweak it again because we, we found something that was wrong. You know, the inspections don't look at everything. Normally the manuals will call out a given area or a given something with a fence around it, so to speak, that the inspector is going to look at this area and they don't necessarily inspect things uh, outside of that area. And, uh, you know, sometimes we get back into those and undo what we've done. And we should call the inspector back, but we, oftentimes we don't because it's sometimes not even the same day when you find it on some of these airplanes. So it's, it's, uh, you know, it's carelessness, it's laziness on the part of maintenance people. And, and sometimes it's trying to keep the cost down. And, it, and, the, and a lot of times it's expediency. The, I mean, this is a training airplane. It doesn't want to be sitting in the hangar any longer than it has to be because it's not making money sitting in the hangar. And um, if you've got a very busy flight school and the operator's trying to get that airplane back on the line, you know, you're trying to turn it real quickly um, distractions. I mean, we don't know the entire story based on the NTSB report. Uh, the question is, why didn't they put the cotter pins back in? Was it because the mechanic got distracted after he readjusted uh, the brake lines and got called away, figured, okay, I remember doing all of that work. We're good to go. I mean, there is a variety of different human elements that may not have been explored. It's obvious that uh, they're not talked about in this report, but they do have an influence. We're always beating up pilots for distraction and things like that. Well, everything that happens in the cockpit happens on the maintenance floor as well. And, um, and you know, so it's very, very um, important that if, uh, if you touch something and then you have to go back and retouch something, you probably have to go back and reinspect whatever it was you just touched. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, just kind of follow up on what you're talking, Greg, there's, there's another little side story here as well. Uh, you know, you're familiar, everybody probably knows that, you know, I used to work and did maintenance and was an inspector at a really large uh, flight school in the U.S. And there's, a, there's another little side element of this, which has nothing, we've had the accident, but we at the flight school, this is something that we had the instructors look at during their walk around, during the pre-flight inspection. 
they always look down on the 172s. They always look down to make sure that the shimmy dampener was attached, that the bolts were in place and the nose gear was there. And uh, we had Piper Seminoles, PA44s. And one of the things that you look for when you get underneath, you're going to check the flaps, you look underneath, everybody looked at the torque links. So I don't know what this particular school's processes and procedures were, but this particular event in one of the schools that I was involved in, this is something that we actually had the flight instructors walk around and, and teach the students when they were training. You know, and the other thing that uh, we both, uh, all three of us talked about, and that is, you know, as an owner of an airplane, I always uh, queried my mechanic as to what they touched. What did you touch when you were working on the airplane, whether it was just through a routine inspection, annual inspection, or some kind of preventative maintenance? Um, because on my pre-flight, as soon as I'm going to pick that airplane up for maintenance, I want to be looking at those things just to make sure that, yep, that, that cotter key is in there or yep that that linkage is hooked up or whatever i could see without tearing into the airplane but i wanted to be able to just double check so that i was assured that something obvious wasn't overlooked missed um, because of uh, the mechanic being distracted or called away whatever and um and so i know that uh, some mechanics some maintenance shops uh will walk around uh, with the pilot or the owner of the aircraft after the work is done. I think it's good practice. I think people who own an aircraft or operate an aircraft should incorporate that, especially uh, out of uh, with any aircraft coming out of maintenance. You know, when you go out to pick up an airplane out of maintenance, the very first thing we talk, and again, at the end of every show, I talk about this, pre-planning for your flight. Well, pre-planning for your flight if you're picking up an airplane after it's been out of service for a week in a maintenance shop, should include looking at all the work that was done. Look at the paperwork. And I, I can't tell you how many times I chided, chided uh, pilots that worked for the charter company that I was doing this work for when I went up and recovered an airplane with them and they'd go out and get in the airplane and I always would wait until they get all done, they got in the airplane, or all three of us are in the airplane, and the door's closed, and then I'd say, come up before they started the airplane. I, what was done to this airplane? And I, I, I mean, I can still picture it in my mind. They would turn and look at one another. They wouldn't say a word. I said, what kind of maintenance was done? I said, did they do anything on the flight controls? Do you know that? Well, you just did a pre-flight. Did either one of you coordinate with the other to make sure that the flight controls moved in the right direction? I saw you move them, but do you know that up means up and down means down? Yeah, and and, and you bring up a good point, John, about, about that because um, I've investigated a number of aircraft over the years that have just come out of the maintenance shop. So of course they remove all the flight control surfaces and then they reinstall them after paint. I don't know how many times I've seen one flight controls hooked up backwards or two, they weren't properly installed. They may have been hung in place. The linkages may have been just, uh, you know, finger tight, but they weren't properly cottered and, and things like that. And that's why it, it, it's, the, it's the devil in the details, if you will. That is, you have got to spend the time to really do a thorough and methodical pre-flight. You should do that all the time. But definitely after any kind of maintenance is done for the very reason that in this particular instant, Jason, you know, if a pilot had walked around and really looked at that torque link, would it have been obvious to him that that cotter pin was missing? No, you know, from, from the, if you're trained and you know what you're looking for and you, it's been explained to you, yes, it's very easy for you to be able to see when you look at it because of the way that it sticks out. But, you know, kind of some of the things that we've mentioned before, to me, we're looking for the counter pin, but the NTSB put one picture in the docket. And from this one photo that we have of the torque links, I find five other things in the picture kind of yeah. alarming. <laughs> so <laughs> it's just, And that's, we, we, that we is alarming <laughs> because the board didn't talk about those five other things in their report. They just focused on why the torque link wasn't attached. Absolutely. So, so if, if you spend just a couple of minutes just explaining to the, to the owners, operators, pilots, student pilots, whoever's, if you just spend just a minute, just tell them, look, this is critical. We've got to look at this, you know, because what that torque link, just for real simple simplicity, when the aircraft comes in and you do the gear swings, 
when you find the gear swings, you always want to look to see if the main tires are wearing oddly. And if the, if the tires are wearing oddly, you have to change the angle of with the way the tire's tracking. That particular bolt that goes through there between the two torque links, you add washers to increase and decrease the spacing to track the aircraft, the main landing gears straight is, ha is how you make that adjustment. So that adjustment in, in that it's not tight, it's loose, but the counter pin is to hold the bolt in there, but you're constantly in that area anyway. You're always lubricating it at the inspection interval. That's, that's an area that you're always looking at. It's right there. So it's kind of an important piece. And then it's easy to see. In, and, and we're going to include this on the website as well so that you can see what we're talking about. But in this particular picture, Jace, you brought up the fact that you saw other things that, again, would be obvious to a pilot on a, uh, on a pre-flight and should be of concern at least to raise questions about really the, the structural capability of these particular parts. Yeah, I, I mean, just as a quick glance, we just took a look at the picture and I know we were looking at the bolt, but just a couple of observations. I mean, you can see how dirty and wet bottom of the ulio strut is with, with sand and dirt attached to it all the way down to the bottom of the gear leg assembly and around. So this, ulio, this, this leg has been leaking for a long time and collecting dirt. And so that's the first thing. The second thing that I kind of noticed in the picture is even though the torque links are separated and open, the lower torque link, you'll notice that half of the paint on the entire upper surface is gone. So what that would lead me to believe is one of two things. Maintenance kind of knew about it and they were constantly using a cleaning solvent to clean the hydraulic fluid off of the arm or the hydraulic fluid has been on there so long that it just wiped the paint off. Hmm. That's an observation. And then on the top torque link, unless you know to look, Right up in the middle, at the top of the torque link in the center where the bolt is, there's a greaser that goes in there. So both the bottom one and the top one have greasers to keep those grease so they move nice and free. It looks and appears as though, even though nothing's hit it, it appears that the greaser is missing or broke off or sheared off. Or, but it doesn't look recent because look how dirty it is when you, when you zoom in the picture and you look. So that looks like it's missing. And then you and I, we talked about the corrosion. I mean... There's no paint on the upper portion of the, of the gear leg assembly that, and then all the rust. Yeah. So, I, I mean, we could go in, <laughs> if I got the parts book out and we started digging through a lot of these things, there's just a lot of concerning things just by walking around and taking a look under here. I just see a lot of things that would lead me to ask a, a, a lot of questions. Yeah. And it's these little things. And again, they are readily visible on a pre-flight inspection and it should raise at least uh, not, not necessarily a concern all the time, but at least it should raise the question in the pilot's mind, is this safe or is that part going to function as it's intended just because of the, you know, the damage, the corrosion uh, that uh, you saw in these pictures that you know, definitely would stand out on a pre-flight inspection. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I see a lot. I see these, this, we're looking at one very small picture taken at one angle of kind of one thing. It would be different if you and I had an opportunity to walk around the whole sure. airplane and do a pre-flight. It would, you know, it would be very interesting to be able to do that. You know, I say it oftentimes on the shows that I like to touch the airplane. When I'm looking at something, I like to touch it. And, you know, and one example I had on, is a, a foreign made helicopter that uses a belt system, a fan belt essentially, to drive a hydraulic pump. And when you open that panel, the pilot would open that panel to look in. It's a busy place. A lot of plumbing, a lot of tubing, lot, lots of things going on. But one simple thing that they can do to make sure that they're not going to have a, a problem 10 or 15 minutes later is reach in and touch that fan belt. Is it tight? Check your tension. Right. And just, it's right there in, in your face, in front of your yeah. face. Just got to reach in and touch it. Yeah. And, uh, and I've been to some mishaps that weren't quite accidents, but mishaps where that belt was loose and it got the, the, the helicopter got away from the pilot because of it, because the hydraulics were not operating at a steady state. Right? The belt was slipping around, hydraulics would drop off, yada, yada, and, and caused a problem. So there's a lot of things that as a pilot, not as a mechanic that you go around. The other thing you can do you're working for a company, a corporate pilot, 
get the mechanic to walk around with you and say, open the panel and say, what would you look at inside this panel if you were came here and looked, right? And so he'll give you some pointers, what to look at, right? He doesn't want to lose you either as a customer or as a friend or a coworker, right? But they will help you understand what you're looking at and it can make all the difference in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Well, switching gears now to uh, an older 172, this is a 19, 56 Cessna 172 and uh according to when it was new <laughs> yeah well I, I get out there before you get me with that one <laughs> yeah I know because uh let's see 1956 that would have still made you pretty old since you were around with the Wright brothers so but the the big thing here is that it was an older 172 according to what the NTSB wrote um this was an airplane that apparently was being owner maintained. Um, and we're going to talk about some choice words that the NTSB used in its probable cause statement. But the pilot apparently uh, was filling the airplane or at least fueling the airplane out of uh, cans that were found in the back of his vehicle. Um, it was 100 low lead fuel. Who knows how clean it was, but apparently was fueling out of cans. The airplane was seen running at uh, high speed up and down the runway several times before the pilot attempted to take off. And um, during the course of uh, finally deciding to take off and becoming airborne, the pilot had a problem with the engine and lost, uh, tried to make it a, a forced landing, put the airplane down in the field, except it looks like it was out of control instead, instead of in control because uh, the airplane hit very hard on the nose, collapsed the front end of the airplane, pushed the, uh, the engine back into the firewall. The airplane then nosed over, came to rest inverted. The pilot received fatal injuries, and we'll talk about some of those injuries um, at the conclusion of, of our discussion, but the board went in and started inspecting the aircraft. They pulled the engine, actually put it on a on a test stand and ran the engine and found that the engine was capable of producing power. So they started looking at other aspects of the fuel system. And one of the findings that they made was with regard to the fuel selector valve. And they put a lot of pictures in the report and Jason and John and I had had, a been, had an opportunity to go through these pictures. And uh, Jason noted a couple of things um, with these pictures with regard to this fuel selector valve because the description by the board in its report was kind of cryptic. And in looking at those pictures, Jace, what, uh, what did you see with regard to the fuel selector handle reg uh, versus the fuel valve itself? So in the, in the pictures that are provided there, if they go into the docket, you guys are going to make those available for everybody to take a look at when they look at the docket. So in this particular model with the setup, uh, in the fuel selector handle itself, the fuel selector is down in the floor. And then there's an extension that comes off of the fuel selector up to which the handle is attached to. And the NTSB noted that they had done a, an inspection of the fuel system where they had applied air through the fuel lines to kind of trace out the routing of where the fuel selector was now. And what they noted was, is that from the photo, you can see that the handle is pointing to the right tank by the, the, the plate, the placard that's there. When in fact, when they blew air through the system, it was picking up fuel from the left tank. And so there's a pin, you'll be able to see in the picture that that particular handle, when it comes up, if you don't note the orientation of the selector under the floor, before you remove the handle on top, it's very easy for you to put the pin back in in the wrong orientation, which it, it, it appears in this particular case that they got it into the wrong orientation. So when you look at the, so because of that, let's, because of that, once they flipped the airplane back over, they noted how much fuel was in the airplane. Well, we know from the pictures that he had brought and purchased Abgas and put gas in the airplane. So they took a ruler and they dipped the tanks. So the, the selector would have showed that it was on the right tank. And in the right tank, it shows that there is about three inches of fuel in the tank, on the right tank. But when you go to the left tank, which where the selector was actually in that position, you mean there's, there's the, less, and, and there's just talking, marginal fuel in it. And you're talking uh, no, uh, selector, that is the pointer versus the actual valve 
being in the left tank position. Correct. The, 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 the selector on top that gives you kind of a mental image of what side you think you're pulling fuel from was 180 out. They had put the handle on 180 degrees out of where it was at for the selection. And, uh, you know, kind of back to maintenance things again, you know, we're looking at the pictures and we look at other things, you know, the, the airplane, you know, from what's been put out here, it looks like the annual inspection hadn't been done in nine years. The airplane was probably out of annual. Um, it's flipped upside down. It's got a lot of oil all over the bottom of it. I've got some oil coming out. So, I mean, there's just some other things from these basic photos that we looked at that we kind of note that uh, uh, would, would play into this and should have been looked at. And the concern, of course, with the board is that the, this owner was maintaining his aircraft or <laughs> in, in the case of this airplane, wasn't maintaining the aircraft and uh, whatever work he had been doing, of course, was improper just by the discussion we just had about the, uh, the fuel selector valve versus the actual handle. Um, he's fueling the airplane out of cans. And like you said, Jace, the airplane was probably not airworthy to begin with since it hadn't had any kind of formal inspection um, in better than nine years. The concern, of course, is, um, you know, this guy isn't, uh, I don't even know if he was a mechanic or not to be able to do this work. Uh, I didn't see any of that information in the report. But the, the bigger point here is that when the NTSB made their determination of probable cause, I've never seen the NTSB use these kinds of words. They, they specifically said that this accident was due to the, the uh, negligent, and they used the word negligent, maintenance performed by the pilot. And to have that kind of strong word in a probable cause is unusual for the NTSB because that's more of a legal conclusion or description rather than a factual conclusion. I mean, negligent is very subjective, but for them to use that term, I think was put in there to emphasize that this airplane should not have been in the air in any way, shape or form. Yeah, and just to add just one more little point on the top, again, you and I are not in the investigation, we're not collecting the data, we're not seeing what's on the inside, but from just the limited information that's been presented, it appears that the aircraft had its land last annual inspection in 2008. But there's a photo in here on the scene of the carburetor off where they separated the carburetor bowl from the, they took the carburetor apart and looked at the inside. Well, you and I know from doing a lot of this, the carburetor float that's inside, there's been a lot of service bulletins and ADs and every carburetor floats. Well, the interesting part, just kind of on a side note, just experience wise, there's a blue float in this particular carburetor. Now, those are current floats and you can use them and there's different manufacturers, whatever. but I believe this particular one, just off the top of my head, actually came out in 2009. So mm -hmm. the last annual is in 2008. The service instructions from Velar and them upgraded to this particular style in like 2009. But again, we don't have a maintenance entry. Mm -hmm. So the NTSB supplied the last two pages of the logbook, which show the maintenance in, in on, but there's not a description in there of re removing and replacing the carburetor float. So wow. did somebody do it? Did somebody else do it? Again, we don't know, but it's just another thing to research while, you, while you're doing the investigation, just kind of go down that trail to figure out who did that. And like, and like any investigation, uh, as an investigator, not only are you looking for those things that caused or contributed to the accident, but there's always peripheral issues that pop up that uh, you know, can, uh, can identify safety deficiencies or areas where uh, safety can be, in, be enhanced. And in this case, the board talked about shoulder harnesses and talked about the fact that in these older aircraft, a retrofit or a, a forward, or I can't say forward fit, but a retrofit of a shoulder harness in this airplane may have played some influencing factor on the survivability of this pilot. Um, they didn't list it and I don't, they didn't put anything in about a recommendation, um, but they did talk about the, uh, the retrofitting would have been obviously very easy to put into an airplane like this, which would suggest 
that they believe that the injuries sustained by the pilot during the course of the forced landing may have been minimized to cause lesser um, you know, uh, damage to the human body and may have led or at least contributed to the survivability of the pilot who unfortunately was a fatality in this particular accident. So, you know, with older airplanes, I know that um, when I was investigating accidents for the board, those are the kinds of things we looked at to enhance safety. Of course, we would always throw out a, a safety recommendation to, uh, to encourage pilots of older aircraft that didn't have shoulder harnesses to install shoulder harnesses. Yes, they, uh, they do cost a price depending on the type that you have and the model of the aircraft that you're putting them in, but you gotta look at what is your life worth? Is it only the worth of the insurance policy you carry on the airplane? Or is it worth more than that to your family and your friends? And you know your employer, if it's a if it's a commercial operator, the fact is is that you can't put a price on that. And so to spend nine hundred bucks or whatever to uh, in, increase your chances of survivability, even in a precautionary or forced landing like this one, probably would have been beneficial. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, John, as we already know how good they are in automobiles why we would put up with it and not having it in our airplanes beyond me. Yeah. Well, when you look at the, uh, the two accidents that we've dissected, and of course, it, the, these two things are not big things. It's not like a wing fell off or the tail fell off um, or the engine you know, came loose and came off the front of the airplane. We're talking a cotter key and a securing pin, both of which are probably no bigger than an inch that led to um, the, the destruction of one airplane and substantial damage to another. It is never the big things. It's always the little and sometimes even the most insidious things that cause or contribute to accidents. And that's why it is so important, not only as a maintenance technician, but of course, as a pilot to really be plugged in especially when airplanes are coming either out of maintenance or other, other times like a, a, the paint shop where you know that major disconnections of flight control surfaces or engine components have taken place. And, um, and that's why to have the mechanic or the person who has reinstalled those components, it's so vital to have a discussion with them. And in some cases, if possible, be able to walk around the aircraft and, and like you preach, John, all the time, not only have them pointed out to you, but of course you touch it to make sure that, yep, it's there, yes, it's secure, rather than just tacitly trusting that it has been done and done correctly. You know, there, there's studies done that say that uh, if, if you see something, you, you have a certain percentage of memory, but if you write it, you're more likely to remember it long-term. Well, this is the same process. You're gonna reach out and touch something. You're gonna remember that. You're gonna remember you put your hand on it and do it over and over and over. And someday you'll, it'll benefit you when you find a problem in that area. And it's gonna benefit you on every flight because there won't be a problem in that area if you do that. So yeah. it, just, it just makes good sense to reach out and touch. Just put your finger on it. Right? You'll be surprised what you come up with. And if you're looking for cotter pins, put your finger where the cotter pin's supposed to be. Make it, bring that in the forefront of your mind and you look at it. You know, pre-flight is not a walk in the woods looking for the, for the squirrels and birds. Uh, <laughs> it's all supposed to be focused on the airplane, looking for deficiencies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, we know you walk in the woods, John, looking for squirrels and birds. <laughs> but only if we find them on, on the beach in Key West. Yeah, there you and go. I want to keep them away from my mojitos. Yeah, exactly. So, well, um, gentlemen, this, uh, this maintenance month of ours, um, again, I think that uh, it's been beneficial to discuss these kinds of issues just to bring to the attention of our listeners and viewers the fact that you can't overlook even the smallest of items when you're doing a pre-flight inspection or being in tuned 
with your particular aircraft. So it's vital, um, especially if you haven't flown the aircraft in a while, you may be doing your own maintenance, even if you are qualified. It's the little things, it's the distractions, it's those things that you could possibly overlook um, just because you've been there so many times, you just assume things have been done, things are still the same because you haven't touched it, then, uh, but through in-service use, of course, we know the condition of the airplane could possibly change. We encourage, of course, you, uh, the, the listeners and the viewers to write us, tell us about some issues you want us to talk about. You can communicate that through our uh, email at flight safety detectives with an S at gmail.com. If you have a story, let's say something happened to you, you overlooked it. We'd love to share that because again, this is all about learning. This is all about the backstories that we try to present. Some of the things that we talked about on today's show with, uh, with this Piper Seneca and the fact that, yeah, the NTSB focused on one thing and that's why the, uh, the torque link separated. But as Jason talked about, there were other things just looking in a picture that raised questions. And hopefully that's the way you're looking at the airplane when you do a pre-flight is you're not just focused on one particular thing, but things that catch your eye that just don't look right. That's what it's all about. And that's what this show is all about. So if you got things, comments that you wanna make, um, you're finding these things beneficial, we greatly appreciate it. Uh, your podcast or you're a subscriber uh, through YouTube, please continue to do that. Uh, tell your friends and family to, uh, to subscribe because that helps us so that we can make the show better. And of course, Jason, I don't want to leave you with the last word because that honor is is uh, bestowed on John. So what words of wisdom do you have in parting from this show with regard to the things that we've been talking about with maintenance? Well, just want everybody when they're doing their pre-flight, just not to be kind of in a zone, you know, pay attention, have a look. Like John said, touch and feel. If it's not normal or it doesn't feel right, ask a question. It doesn't hurt to ask a question, ask a shop or call somebody. And you know, Greg, I, I, I I don't want to put an advertisement out there for you, but if, you know, if people have questions and they want to ask, they should send questions to the show. I yeah. get questions all the time. I probably answer 50 questions a week. So if they have a question, they want to see something or, or they need us to point them in the right direction, man, do we have the app? We, we can get them to the right person. Yeah, so absolutely. You, That's a great just, point, Jace. Yeah. Good education. They want to do it. Let's do, let's just get them to the right people. Absolutely. Yes. Without a doubt. And all right, so I'll remind everybody that uh, today's show has been brought to you by PAMA, the Professional Aviation Maintenance Association, and by Avemco Insurance, a premier general aviation uh, insurance company here in the United States. And if you need insurance, Howell Insurance, liability insurance, it's insurance as a, a CFI, whatever kind of insurance you need for general aviation, Give Avemco a call, 888-879-0389. Didn't want to make a mistake on that. 888-879-0389. <laughs> Give them a call. Great people to deal with. And if you are going to fly, do it right. Pre-plan your flight. Look at where you're taking off from. Look at where you could put it down if you have a problem. You know, do a little little desk flying to figure out what's going to happen along, along your route and what you're going to do if you're going a long way, if weather changes, whatever. A very detailed pre-flight planning goes a long way. And then when you get out to the airplane, do a very thorough walk around, not a walk in the woods looking for squirrels, right? <laughs> yeah. Get out there and look at your airplane, touch your airplane, right? And then if you get uh, in the cockpit and go fly, please fly safely. And don't fly if you haven't flown in a while unless you have somebody with you that has, right? We just, we have an accident rate that's going up very rapidly right now. And some of these things that we mentioned are the reason why. So please pay attention and don't be a statistic. <laughs>